So I did the calculation myself and I will cover that for, for first three codes. An application of shift is effective. Yours is actually hard to be covered. <laughs> Uh, in, in one session. Two years of... Uh, uh, two years, yeah. Yep. You can tell it's a result of two years. Okay, so an example. So some examples and applications. Examples and applications of shifted symplectic structures and uh, kind of the theorem we proved about Lagrangian intersections and so on. So let y, let y be a smooth and a proper the Montfort uh, stack, stack with connected geometric fibers. Connected geometric fibers of, let's say, dimension D. Okay. Um, here are the things that you can show, uh, you know, having the shift to simplicity structures, here are some of the results that you can have. One is that the choice. Of a, a fundamental class, fundamental class of y inside here, H2D of uh, Durham, oh well, you know, okay, so H2D Durham of y o determines a Determines a um, canonical canonical two times one minus d shifted synthetic shifted synthetic four so it's an element of cohomology class and this thing. Already itself, this cohomology class is there determined in the Durham cohomology of Y, a, a shifted symplectic form of this degree. Uh, again, these things actually, these are corollaries that you can find in the paper of PPDP. I'm just summarizing them because I would like to actually tell you, work out some example today for you. Okay. And on the so okay, so six seven four on the on the derived where is this form live? On the derived stack of uh, perfect complexes complexes um, with flat connections on Y. These are just color corollaries. I'm not going to prove it. I'm just summarizing, but one of them at least I will show you very explicitly. One of the corollaries. Okay, so this is one result. So, in fact, uh, so that's it. Yeah, two. Two, the choice of a fundamental. Class, mm. fundamental class Y, again, in H Dalvo, with respect to Del Bar operation, Dalvo cohomology of Y is uh, determines, determines a uh, the canonical. Times one minus the shifted symplectic structure, symplectic structure, and oh, sorry, Sym not, not the structure. I'm sorry, symplectic form, symplectic.
before on drive the stack on drive the stack of perfect complexes complexes with hex fields <laughs> same hex field on what So, by the way, this R perf, the draft is stack of perfect complexes on Y, and in this double sense is the same as the R mapping space, or the derived mapping space from Y, double with a degraded algebra structure given by the Dalbo cohomology or Dalbo algebra to the R perf. So you want to have perfect complexes on a variety, you're looking at maps from the variety to that modular piece of perfect complexes, right? So, uh, so sorry, I'm, I'm a little confused. Isn't that a uh, class zero if y is of dimension d? Uh, yeah, it's not class zero, why is it class zero? Yeah, it, it, it's, it, a, it, it's, it's a fundamental it's, cycle. It, it is one of the uh, h to d zero, right? H lower to D. Oh, sorry, sorry. What, what, what's H lower to D? I, I H lower to homology cycle. And the Dalbo homology is the maximum dimension homology cycle. So, sorry, what was the definition? It's like, uh, what is the definition of a fundamental cycle in the usual cohomology theory? Yeah? Uh, I don't know the definition of that cohomology theory. Uh, so. This cohomology theory is the cohomology theory of the variety with respect to algebra forms where your differential structure is given by Dal Bode derivative. Del bar operator. Ah, oh, I, I see. Del bar operator. I, I see. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So that's that. And then uh, <clears throat> three, the choice of uh, These are corollaries of the theorem we proved last time. The choice of trivialization, uh, trivialization, omega canonical with variety with O, let's say over a, over a field, let's say, determines a, determines a, a canonical Canonical two minus d shifted symplectic form symplectic and form on the derived stack again on the derived stack of perfect complexes. I'm oh, sorry. That's okay. Perfect complexes. Um, on y. Again, the just drive the stack of perfect complexes on y is defined as the derived mapping stack from y to the derived stack of all perfect complexes. Okay, so this is the other formulary that they prove. Uh, for if M is a compact uh, orientable orientable topological manifold on its manifold of dimension D uh, just a very quick question yeah no is that Higgs field yeah Higgs field Higgs field, like a connection. So how, how does it? Uh, well, I'm not going to prove. Yeah, it. no, no. I'm, 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 I'm asking even the definition of Higgs field in this context. The I, I know Higgs field. Context, context, I mean, field, we, we pick some, pick some complex in the derived category or some element of R perf. Okay, pick some. Uh, no, okay, so pick some complex, perfect complex on Y. You can define. Uh, uh, so we have this notion of 
Endomorphism or endomorphism exactly. So you can look at the cotangent complex Y, okay, and the Higgs field is given by sections of the endomorphism algebra of this complex twisted with the cotangent complex. But twisting here is the direct tensor drive. Okay. But then you can actually define this notion of um, uh, Higgs type uh, Higgs type fields. I mean, in, in terms of D brain, this is Champagne and Bundle. So like what that. bundle? Chan 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 pattern. I have no idea. No, no, because no. I don't even know. I mean for you find find you just describe. Okay, okay. <laughs> so but you you can always you can also have uh, for any line bundle you can you can and any object in the derived category, anything. So any line bundle, any, any object like that, you can also define uh, this notion of L L Higgs pair. Yeah. So it can be a Any any sheet actually you can have L L Higgs pairs like that, sure. and the Higgs field is the map like this, which you can actually realize as a section of. The connection. It's the connection with with values with values, with values in here. Okay, thank you. I was curious about this term. Yeah. yeah, but but naturally it is always going to be the cotangent bundle of the variety, or in this case actually cotangent. Bundle. You can you should, you can define. Okay, so so you have that. If this is an orientable, if this is a topological manifold of dimension B, then so the choice of a again fundamental class fundamental class in here. Over, over this field determines a determines a canonical two minus d shifted two minus d shifted symplectic form on uh, on the derived stack on this R perf of f. Sorry, do you mean the D's homology? Yes. Yeah, but uh, you wrote 2D. Uh, D, uh, yeah, that's right, I'm sorry. Correct. Correct. Uh, so, so what's the, what, 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 can, can we write this uh, per, uh, R perf M more concretely? Uh, for, for example, if M is, uh, is a surface, can we write it as a uh, uh, like uh, the homomorphism from pi one to GL uh, quotient by conjugacy. Yeah, yeah. I, I really homomorphism from pi one. That would be bundles. That yeah. would be just bundles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but uh, the the perfect complexes are built out, uh, built from bundles, right? Mm -hmm. With all J ends, all ends, yeah. all ends. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It, 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 you, you can glue this to get this. Uh, Definitely. Eventually, you well, if uh, you make it bigger, you will get it. Yeah. Ah, thanks. Gluing in the sense of you cannot glue them, you cannot glue them. But uh, the correct statement is that the R perf on the on the M on the variety as connected components determined by the order of the automorphism group. Or the rank of the atom group is well, continuous. But I, I wonder if uh, if I write it this way, only pi one of m is relevant, right? Uh, local that's system. just a yeah. That's just that's just a simple object in, in on m. A simple complex is on m. And I cannot detect higher homotopy. No, oh. no. Uh, I see. Thanks. No. Okay. So. All right. So now let us talk about what I wanted to mention. So these are the corollaries of the previous theorem. This was actually left from the last time. So now let me say something. Uh, so if you remember, I told you that a long time ago, not a long time ago, but maybe 2008-9, People were under the impression that if you have a moduli space and has a and that has a self uh, self symmetric perfect obstruction theory, 
that much less this can be written as a critical locus. It's not true, of course. This was proved by Fadrofandi and Thomas in a beautiful paper. The paper is all about the counter example, actually. And the statement that we proved so far is that if you have a minus one shifted symplectic structure, you can always loc locally write your marginalized this as a critical locus of a function, a degree zero function. Degree zero meaning that that function lives in the algebra of the underlying marginalized space or scheme, and it's sitting in the degree zero. So is it something like Darboth? Uh, no, no. Absolutely, that's the local Darboth, uh -huh. and that's the Joyce's, Joyce's uh, construction. And then, for the four folds, his construction that Joyce actually shows that if you have, for the four folds, your shifted symplectic structure will be two minus d shifted symplectic structure, and four fold has this dimension four, so it is minus two shifted symplectic. And then your modular space of coherent shifts on the fourfold also can be written as a critical locus, but this time your function sits in a degree, which degree? Two. That's not Joyce and me, that's you and me. That's you and <laughs> that's you and me. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> that's no, not true. Did not exist. Local, local thing, local no, thing. No, not even you. locally. Locally, it is still jo uh, Joyce uh, bra. Yeah. Uh, they prove ah. it not only for minus one, they prove it for all shifts, but locally it is. Ah, uh, okay. But Good. the global potential. The global potential is me and him, but it has not been produced yet. So. <laughs> but so yes, the, hopefully, the, hopefully. The paper by Joyce and myself is only uh, constructing the basis, or attempt to construct the basis. Okay. But let me t actually tell you something about how nice shifted symplectic structures are and how do they communicate with deformation obstruction fields. So let's talk about this already known example. If you have a minus one, so we would like to say minus one shifted symplectic structure, symplectic structure, and symmetric uh, and uh, symmetric symmetric obstruction fields. Oh, sorry, what was symmetric obstruction theory? Symmetric. Okay, so. So I will tell you what it is. Let's say you have a scheme, which is going to, to be for us a little common scheme like that. Yeah. Then you look at the cotangent complex of this scheme. Uh -huh. And the cotangent complex of this scheme, if this scheme is actually a smooth, if it is a smooth, yes. then the cotangent complex is very easy. It's just a cotangent bundle yes. of this scheme. And if it is not as smooth, you can realize this object in the drive category up to quasi isomorphism by embedding this non smooth thing in ambient to smooth thing yes. and then resolving. Yes. So you re embed this thing inside something is smooth, and you can resolve. You look at the cotangent bundle of this guy, you push it, pull it back in, in here, and you resolve. Yeah. So via this embedding, you can basically get a map like that. And then you resolve, the first thing is the conormal sheaf. What is the conormal sheaf? This embedding has an ideal. X inside ambient this smooth thing has an ideal. And this is the conormal yes. bundle or conormal sheaf of X inside this ambient this smooth guy. And th this keeps going. Yes. So this is really the cotangent complex of X. Yeah. It has a term in degree zero and then minus one and it keeps going like that. The idea of um, intersection theory is that you would like to you would like to basically realize X as sitting inside a bundle. So you would like in the intersection theory, so in intersection theory, you would like to think of your X as sitting inside the bundle, which detects, so let's say X is parameterizing something. In this case, actually, X is parameterizing points, points of X. If, and on every point of X, you would like to realize a bundle sitting on X whose fibers are realizing basically obstructions to the formations of these things. If X is a smooth, then you can just calculate an invariant for X. If X is a smooth, one of the invariants for X, which is the affirmation invariant or topological invariant, is Euler characteristic of X. So you can just calculate topological Euler characteristic of X by taking the top churn class of tangent bundle of x, integrated against x, and probably this with the minus sign. But this is a topological invariant, and it's also, also, of course, obviously deformation. 
If x is not a smooth, yeah. this guy will be another bundle. Yeah, yes. So what you do, you embed x inside some ambient to smooth thing, and then you can look at what this thing looks like inside the ambient to smooth thing. But that thing is exactly the co-normal bundle, or it's dual. Okay. The problem though is that if you pick this co-normal chief, yeah. I mean this. By the way, this minus thing, you can put it inside here, and this will make it like that, right? So the co-normal and the cotangent, yeah. you see? Okay, so that's why. So you can use this guy, put it inside here. The problem is that this guy being a sheaf jumps in the matrix, yeah. and this will not produce for you a deformation invariant. So now you realize to find some bundle which actually comes uh, from some construction that realizes obstructions to deformations of points in X, and it stays as a bundle. Okay. For now, you can al already see that the co-normal co -normal of X inside this ambient to smooth this scheme is given by, well, this is sitting in degree minus one, right? And this is the cotangent complex, right? So it is given by H1 of L dot of X dual. And it's uh, something that sits in degree one, yeah. so it is shifted by minus one in yeah. the black box. Okay, so <laughs> can I use this thing in here? No, of course not, because I can calculate Euler class or top term class of this guy. Against x, and I yeah. will not get an invariant. So not an invariant. So here is where the deformation obstruction theories can become useful. The deformation obstruction theory is a complex that needs to understand tangent space to points of x correctly, deformations of those, and the obstructions. But the obstruction in, produced by it should remain as a bundle. So probably it needs to understand points of x correctly in the level of tangent space, yes. but it might have bigger obstructions yeah. so that the bigger thing behaves like a bundle. So it needs to compensate for what obstructs this from the bundle. You add what is obstructing this from being a bundle, and you that thing that you get is the obstruction bundle. So if this guy has a term, a B minus two term, this looks this has an image in here. So this is surjects onto its image, and this one injects inside here. Yes. You would like to add this piece to here, yes. and the whole thing remains a bundle, right? If yes. I if I add this thing to in here, the whole thing cannot have a kernel, yeah. right? So it remains as a bundle. Yeah. So what does that say? That says that you know there exists there exists some object in the Dirac category of your scheme or a stack or whatever, yeah. together with the map. Such that this map is important because you would like this map to detect that this object realizes deformation of spaces of f points of x correctly. So you want this thing to be isomorphism. Yes. But then you would like this map, this h minus 1, or in the dual level, h1, you would like this map to be a subject. If you can find yes. a complex in the derived category, yes. which gets map, obviously this map is not an identity because otherwise it's just a potential. Yes. If you can find a map from here to here yes. that detects deformation spaces correctly, but its h1, its h minus 1 is bigger, yeah. yes. that means that then you can calculate an invariant for x by taking the top term class of h1 of e dot rattle, dual, and integrate it in sex and your hope is to get a deformation in there. So this object in the drive category together with this map is called deformation obstruction theory because it's a something who understands deformations and obstructions. Thanks. Okay. But does the invariant depends on the choice of absolutely. 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 This way, you can have multiple invariants for your scheme. As long as you can find uh, co complexes which satisfy this problem, this, this property, your invariants might be different.
even for a smooth space, you can actually define several different types of invariants. So uh, such e always exists, right? No, mm -hmm. Not always. Uh, th does such e always exist? Yeah, you, uh, it's not necessarily unique, but this no, is. No, yes. That's right. Yeah. It could be also trivial. Uh -huh, yeah. Could be also trivial. In this case, we say the space is unobstructed. It's just a smooth. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, okay, so this is what the deformation obstruction field is. And so, here is what I want to say. So, uh, recall that recall that for a um, that given a derived stack uh, f, for instance, which is locally of finite presentation, finite presentation. Uh, it's truncation. It's truncation comes equipped with comes equipped with comes equipped with a natural uh, natural perfect deformation obstruction theory. This I have probably mentioned in the past. This is not trivial at all. There, this is a paper. This is Timashur and uh, Toen and Betsozi. Actually, when this paper came out, uh, Timo was in the same building as me. And uh, he was German. So this is that thing. And how do you construct such a thing? Uh, well, uh, you will get equipped uh, as, as follows. So you have some map from truncation of your drive the stack into your drive the stack. Which induces a pullback morphism. Morphism, J star. You can pull back uh, this uh, cotangent complex of your ambient drive stack, a smooth drive stack, and gets mapped to the L dot cotangent complex of the truncation of your stack. Uh, assume that, uh, okay. and so basically this thing will be the deformation of structure field. So is this in the bounded derived category? Absolutely. Uh, wh why bounded derived category of this one. Uh, wh why is it bounded? Mm, well, <laughs> yeah, um, this is really... Isn't it by this presentation? Finite presentation, yeah. Ah, I see. Yeah. Is it uh, this kind of result also the source of experiment uh, for a while trying to have this concrete uh, interact to have uh, only the degree zero and degree minus one appearance component uh, of each step? And then at some point it would be impossible to remain the remaining structure derived from this Look at this only. Remember this uh, two cases of Baron's derived uh, uh, algebra from like this? Yes. One and two. And there he developed this field theory of perfectly open algebra to the truncation. Completely. This is the reason. But it's I should say that those are not at the, those are not uh, two pages anymore. No, no. But the, <laughs> the thing is that uh, Cohen, for example, was yeah. uh, uh, sharply against this approach. Uh, he uh, was uh, offended by him uh, theorizing that this field. He cannot understand why uh, there's a point of truncation. Uh, I think it's too um, and, but then Joyce actually wrote this big book on the uh, G manifold where the yeah. truncation thing, he actually made everything perfect. That's right. Perfect. Okay. 
this is the same case with the heuristic equivalence. Okay, so now assume that, now this is for any driver stack. Now assume that, finitely presented this move. Now assume that, now assume that F comes equipped with a minus one shift to simplex instructor. Then let's see what happens for us. So the structure double omega. So this is a minus one shift simplectic form. We write the underlying two form of degree minus one, minus one as a morphism of uh, perfect complexes. So again, a shift is symplectic form is an infinite tuple of forms, right? And then it has an underlying degree zero part and that is the one that gives us the quasi-isomorphism between tangent and cotangent modulo and shift. So let's call it like that. And then for this one, I call that that underlying form as omega itself. And it's the thing that gives a map from this tensor product of cotangent complex of f to O of f shifted by minus one. This is the minus one shifted since uh, omega is non-degenerate. It's a symplectic form. Then, uh, then uh, this in immediately induces a map from the tangent complex of F to put this on the other side. The tangent complex of F shifted by minus one. And this is the definition. You have this thing now. Uh, now this induces, uh, and, and uh, this is the definition, but also this is a quasi isomorphism. Okay, um, this now induces, so which induces now a map from symmetric. Uh, Second product of cotangent complex of F shifted by minus two. Uh, this is the same as tangent complex of F times tangent complex of F, right? Because each one of them is the L dot of F minus one. Two O F minus one, which is the same as saying we could get a map from symmetric second product of L dot of F to OF1. We put the shift on here. Okay. This pairing is non degenerate, non degenerate and induces an isomorphism, an, an equivalence, an equivalence of L dot of F, T dot of F, one. This is the same as that, that's yes, that's right. Yeah. This is just the dual of that thing. Uh -huh. If you dualize this, this will become L dot of F, do like this one, T, of, T dot of F, shifted by one. Okay. Or you can just go in the opposite direction. <laughs> hmm? you or you can go to the opposite direction. So now, 
you have this thing now restricting restricting to truncation everything was for f truncation we would like to restrict to the truncation of this drive this time uh, that's, that's t c t zero f or t zero r t zero f oh okay okay f. our drive the stack is here it's called f okay if you restrict to the truncation what do you get so we have the this truncation I call the j from here to here and so I can just restrict so we find that. Uh, find that uh, E, which is by definition the pullback of the cotangent complex of F, yeah. the obstruction theory, okay, becomes isomorphic to, well, because of this, isomorphic to E dot dual shifted by one. And this thing actually goes to cotangent complex of this. So now you can see that E dot and E dot dual shift by with a shift are equal to each other. So now you have an obstruction theory for your truncated. I mean, zero truncation of the drive the stack, the underlying stack, which satisfies this symmetry. And this is precisely the definition of perfect symmetry, which is symmetric, which is symmetric, and by Behrens and Fanteki. And then Fanteki defines a symmetric perfect obstruction theory. And by the way, when we say symmetry, it always has this shift in it. This is the definition of the symmetric perfect obstruction theory in the sense of chi by Barrett. Okay, so this is nice, right? So as soon as you now we realize that, after all, understanding modular stacks in the level of their ambient drive stacks and then investigating whether the ambient drive stack has shifted symmetric structure is useful. Tells, of, tells us about the existence of a symmetric obstruction theory. Now, again, Having a symmetric obstruction theory in this level does, did not imply that this is actually a critical locus of function, but then Joyce and group proves that it is. If it has a shifted symmetric structure, so having a shifted symmetric structure is actually implies this statement and implies the, margin, the stack being the critical locus. But this alone doesn't. Uh, so the untruncated stack being a uh, critical locus, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. Locally. 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 Okay. Locally. Okay. Locally. Locally. And that has the local Darbo theorem. Okay. Alright. Good. So this is uh, this is that. Now, I mm, I wanted to say something else, maybe. Uh, did I say it in here? Yeah, so this is good. Another example, maybe Lagrangian intersections. These are examples of uh, uh, basically how useful this theory is. Let uh, x and omega be a smooth, be a smooth uh, symplectic scheme. Over K, some field with two with two smooth Lagrangians, Lagrangian sub schemes L and L prime, then the 
to closed immersions L and L prime inside X are endowed with are endowed with a unique Lagrangian structure. And in fact, uh, you can look at the fiber, homotopy fiber product of the two Lagrangians, homotopy product on X via these embedding maps or these immersions, uh, carries a, carries a um, natural minus one shifted Minus one shifted symplectic structure. Uh, so, sorry, I'm a little confused. So why why do we have a unique Lagrangian structure? I, I think there might be many trivializations of the of the zero symplectic form, right? Uh, uh, um, let me. Yeah, so, so for example, in the smooth category, uh, every uh, first homology, cohomology class is a trivialization of the trivial. There is no cohomology. This is no cohomology. Yeah. This is uh, undirected. Uh, undirected. Just cluster. Yeah, Everything yeah. here happens on the nodes. Yeah, but, uh, but, but a trivialization of zero is a closed form, right? A closed form is a trivialization of the trivial. Here, here, you're, here these Lagrangian structures. Yes. So just the conditional yeah. vanishing of the form. The of the form. So here you drive the stack and it's truncation. So, there is no, uh, so usually it would be a, a, a co-boundary. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. There is nothing that, that can give you a co-boundary here. You, you can also formulate it this way, but all co-boundaries here are necessarily zero. Because uh, uh, there is no, uh, there are no complexes. All complexes are constituted in degree zero. Uh -huh. Which means that if you took, take the same definition of uh, uh, vanishing uh, of the form with being co boundary, uh -huh. since uh, everything is considered to be zero, all co boundaries are literally zero. Uh -huh, I, I see. Thanks. So, but but to, to answer your question, when you study a situation where this is just a, not a smooth scheme, but the, it, uh, you know, it could be a truncation of a drive, smooth drive stack, then you, what you're saying is correct. Everything is unique optohomology. But I would actually. But then, have... in fact, this choice of homotopy is part of Lagrangian structure. Yeah. yeah. So this is a, you cannot say Lagrangian structure without making this choice. Yeah. So in, in other words, every time that you say Lagrangian structure, yeah. there is a chosen uh, path to zero. Just here, there is no other path. Uh -huh. I see. Which we will now see in an example, in a good example. Uh, again, this um, defines. A um, symmetric, perfect um, uh, obstruction theory, obstruction theory of amplitude minus one zero, meaning that that object in the drive category only has cohomologies in minus one and zero levels on the truncation. That is usual usual scheme theoretic theoretic uh, fiber product L times L two prime over X but not non homotopy. The usual one. So this is really nice, right? So you have the, the smoother scheme, you have the Lagrangians, but the Lagrangians might not be transverse. Intersecting, but not transverse. The idea is that this non-transverse intersection is realized as a, as a drive stack with the minus one shift and some structure. 
and the minus function simplex structure tells you that this intersection itself can actually uh, be having a nice, well-defined definition of structure. This is very useful. Okay. Now let me actually I told you so before coming to the class, I was actually thinking of what else to cover, and then I worked out a somehow a sloppily an example of this. Maybe it has some errors, so you need to help me fix those things. But I will make an example of this Lagrangian intersection. So here is an example. Example Lagrangian intersection of multi aspects and degeneration technique. So this is the shift theoretic analog of Julie. Julie's degeneration. Sorry, can you help me? Okay. And uh, what is the idea? Well, of course, he has worked out for ideal sheets and certain objects in the drag category, but you're going to do it for perfect. Okay. So let us start with the following. So let, let us start x5 be the quintic threefold. Denote x5 and p4. Denote quintic threefold and p4. Then let uh, let us degenerate this thing. Let this curly arrow represent the degeneration of quintic to a quartic and uh, p3. Okay, so this is a quartic, quartic threefold, and this is P3. It's very easy to do that. So if you look at the underlying polynomial of F, polynomial of X5 in five homogeneous variables of P4, then you induce a new variable T, which is taking values in affine line, and then you look at vanishing locus of this polynomial that that gives you over the affine line a degeneration of your variety so you start from x5 and it degenerates for t not equal to 0 degenerates to t equal to 0 to a normal crossing variety which is given by the zero locus of f4 and f1 and this is the cortic and this is the p3 hyperplane section of Okay. If you do this, actually, you realize that uh, let's call this uh, family something. Family of x curly x. The family total space of this family, which is a fourfold over, over the affine line. So let x uh, be the total space of the degenerating family. Family, there exists a locus of singularity. Singularity uh, in X four in X of type one four five. It's a curve. So if you look at if you look at these two things. Okay, so this defines for you a quintic, this is this thing, and then this defines for you another quintic. You intersect these two things, you will get some complete intersection of type four, 1, 4, 5, which is a curve, called dimension 3, in your fourfold, which is the locus of your singularity. So the total of the space is not singular. Therefore, we smoothen the family. by blowing up 
going up along this locus. Okay. So we blow up this family along the divisor that which, which, which we have in here. You see, you have a divisor. This special fiber for this fourfold family is a divisor. But it has a locus of singularity. And so this is, you, you really need to blow up this family along this divisor as a way divisor. So when you do it like that, uh, let's call the new family and call it, and call it, uh, let's say, x prime, the new family. And what does x prime look like? Again, over the t naught equal to zero, it has x five, and over the special fiber, this part of it x four doesn't change, but this p three part will be replaced by blow up of p three along this curve of uh, intersection type four five. Okay, I would like to call this thing fun of variety one. And I will call this thing fun of variety two. I have a degeneration of a Claudio threefold into a normal crossing variety where the pieces are each funnel and they are glued along anti canonical divisor. And this divisor in the middle is a degree four thing because this is degree four. So this divisor in the middle is in fact K3 circuit. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, some degeneration. Because the smooth, because the total space of this degenerating family is a smooth, this is what is in the literature, this is called good degeneration. Good degeneration means that it's a degeneration which, whose total space is a smooth and whose special fiber is a normal crossing in it. This is a normal crossing in it. And both of the, uh, these two components are final. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Now, these are both functions. Okay. So, now let us assume, let us assume, let us assume M of X stands for modular stack, modular stack of Perfect complexes or coherent sheaves, if you like, or coherent sheaves for now. Coherent sheaves, F, in a billion carrier of coherent sheaves, with fixed strand connection. Fixed strand connection. Okay? The whole Technique of degeneration when you apply to the moduli stack is that somehow you would like to count sheaves in here, and you would like to relate counting of sheaves in here to counting of sheaves on this side and on this side with some relative profile against this relative divisor in the middle. This is exactly what you needed in Gramovity theory. So you have, you want to count curves, you can degenerate your family a family of curves like this, where curves in here have relative profile mu1, curves in here have relative profile mu2, and you would like the profiles match with, with each other. So curves in here have curve classes beta, curves in here have curve classes beta1 and beta2, and you would like to say that the Gramovitan partition function of curves beta Inside x5, the gram of written partition function can be written as the sum of the product of gram of written partition function of curves beta 1. These are curves beta 1 inside y1, y2. Inside y1, uh, with relative profile against this divisor in the middle, I call it surface x times Gramovitan partition function of curves with class beta 2 inside y2 with relative profile again along s. So this is the profile 
mu2, and this is the profile mu1, and you multiply these things, and that's your partition function of Ramovitz. The amazing construction of Junli actually works for all varieties, for Calabia three varieties, of any curve class, and that, that ends the story there. This Gramovitz and this is the these are the relative Gramovitz and invariants. Even though this relation in the level of partition functions and also the relation between virtual cycle of the modulus of curves in here and the virtual cycle of the modulus of relative curves in here and relative curves in here has been done. Calculation of the relative gramma with an invariance on this slide is very calculated, complicated. It's fair to say that very few people actually in the world can calculate relative gramma with an invariance. Maybe less than number of fingers in the hand, in one hand. It's very complicated. So th does this equality hold? Hmm? Yes, equality holds. Uh -huh. The equality is produced by Finding a relation between virtual cycle of the modulus of curves in here and the virtual cycle, the relative virtual cycle in here and here, and then because the cycles match, integration against them does match. The caveat actually calculated invariance, that's a good thing. Oh, so, so we have related the uh, spectral right. fiber with the general fiber. That's right. Uh -huh. Thanks. That's right. The reason we do this, motivating it at least, is because, well, how can you count curves in the quintet Calabria? There is no way of doing it. Often, all the methodology of gramma witten theory depends on torus localizations and things like that. There is no torus in here. But this method actually helps you because we see at least already here you have a blow up of P3. <laughs> so if you take this thing, you go to cortex and a blow up of P3, that's toric. This is a toric threefold, project, toric projective threefold. This is well, projective but not toric. Then maybe you can take cortic and project again degenerate it to the cubic and some other thing. So by multifold degeneration, eventually you will get degeneration of this thing to two P3s. The P3s are totally projective, and the hope is that you can reverse engineer this thing and calculate it. It's useful. This technique. Okay, so why am I saying this in here? I told you a kind of a glimpse of the motivating actually the story of Gramo Witten theory because, uh, to say that you know we can have the same thing for sheaves. Now we have a degenerating family, we have made sure that this is a good degeneration, so we have a quintic Calabria of threefold and it has degenerated into two varieties, funnels, meeting along some K3 surface. You're gonna fix sheaves in here with churn character zero. So you look at the modulus base of X5, which is the sheaves in X5 with churn of F fixed to be churn zero. And we can ask notion of modulus base of sheaves in X4 relative to S and modulus base of sheaves, oh sorry, not X4 y1, which is the same as x4, but y2 is not the same as p3, relative to s. Let's say this is the marginalized space of, this is the same as the set of f1, for instance, incoherent sheaves on y1 with churn equal to churn1, such that it satisfies a relativity condition. So this is our relativity condition, tor1, over O Y1 of F1 O of S, we would like to be equal to zero. And this one, this is this. This one is the, again, set of sheaves F2 in coherent sheaves on Y2 with churn equal to churn 2 together with relativity condition, which is again some Tor vanishing condition. So Tor 1 over O Y2 modules of F2 OS equal to zero. In algebraic geometry, this vanishing tor condition is the same as transversality. Algebraic transversality. Okay? So, this vanishing tor condition in the moduli space of shoes with churn character one defines for you an open condition. 
So in fact, this thing that I have written in here is an open locus of this modular space of all sheets on y1. So in fact, m of y1 over s, the way I have defined it as, as this set and as a scheme, is open inside m of y1. And m of y2 over s is also open inside m of y2. So let's say we can compactify these things. So assume we know how to compactify. Okay. Again, those of you familiar with grammar with theory, Julie also had the issue. Because you're embedding curves, you're obtaining curves, and then you would like your curve, I mean, your curve might not have the situation, I mean, this is the perfect ideal situation. Your curve has this nice profile, bunch of points. This is basically the degree of the intersection of the curve transversely with that divisor, but your curve might fall inside the divisor. Then, what is the profile of that curve against that divisor? You, need, you, you realize that then the modulitis occurs with this nice transverse intersection is open. So you need to compactify. And the bubbling phenomenon take care, take care of compactification. In fact, in here, bubbling phenomenon also takes care of the compactification. You bubble things up, and your sheet gets stretched inside the bubbles, and it eventually becomes transverse. OK? When I say these things, for ideal sheaves and something called PT stable pairs, this bubbling phenomenon was shown to be the right, uh, give you the right compactification. But for all other types of sheaves, this construction does not exist here because of certain difficulties. I'm not going to go there. But I would like to, to discuss something else. So let's say now we have two compactifications of these modular spaces, relative modular spaces. Okay. So now I, I say something about shifted symplectic structures. Okay, so, so we have this thing now. Here is a theorem. So you have the moduli space of X5, and it has degenerated into two relative moduli spaces, Y1 over S, and uh, and uh, y2 over s, and the two together map to, via some restriction maps, our i's are the restriction maps, to the moduli space of, well, I can write uh, like this moduli space of sheaves on S, right? So for instance, if your variety was a threefold like this and you were looking at sheaves supported, these are D4, D2, D0 brains in the string theory, so supported on divisors, then you degenerated your threefold into a picture like this. This was the K3 surface in the middle. You would like to hope that well, this hyperplane section or this divisor hypersurface section, this degenerates into something like this. Let's call that H1 and H2. So you have now a modular space of sheaves supported on H1 and the modular space of sheaves supported on H2. And via restricting this sheaf, think of it as a bundle, restricting this whole sheaf to this divisor here, you will get this curve of intersection in the middle and sheaves which are supported on the curve of intersection. And those are objects inside this modular space. So the two maps are the restriction maps. Okay. So, so here is a theorem. Theorem. Let Ri from M of Yi over S to M of S denotes the restriction 
restriction embedding map restriction embedding map then R I satisfies satisfies the conditions of uh, being of inducing Lagrangian structure structure i.e. in other words this map that I defined in, in during the last session from relative tangent complex of Ri to L dot of M of Yi over S shifted by minus one is a quasi-isomorphism. Isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? You have moduli space of sheaves on a generic smooth variety. Your degenerate in your variety becomes broken like this. You have the compactification of moduli space of sheaves on this side, which are meeting this guy transversely. Compactification of moduli space of sheaves on this side, which turn character two, let's say, which meet also transversely. And then the idea is that you can also restrict to the moduli space of restriction of these sheets on the device in the middle, that is M of S. And it says that each one of these relative moduli spaces are in some sense Lagrangians inside you. So, sorry, it, yeah. so in this statement, uh, do you uh, hiddenly put uh, Jindy's uh, reconstruction into, uh, with, a, with a deformation of abstraction theory, in, in, in what it does into this uh, derived? So I haven't, uh, no, I haven't yet done it, right? Oh, so I saw all, this, uh, all that I have done so far is I have just degenerated my graph. No, no, no. And I, I, I mean, when you say the no. condition of, of this... Uh, the conditions of inducing the Lagrangian structure. This honest, like... This is the condition. Remember, the, what was the Lagrangian structure? If you have a map from a drive to stack to another drive to stack... Right, right. So, so I'm saying this is... This, uh, I'm saying the... The setup in the theorem is a derived. Uh, That's it's a right. It's derived. It's so you, so you, put, uh, you put you uh, put Jindy's work uh, also in, into a derived stack version. Yes, you can say that. Uh, but, I mean, because I. It's not Jindy's work basically anymore. Right, right, right. So, this, so, so, so. Not anymore. So there's something beyond. What it's beyond. Beyond. What That's it right. Says. It has been worked out today. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> I don't think this actually exists anywhere. That's why it might have flaws, but this is my attempt. In showing to you, I mean, I, I worked it out all morning. <laughs> so, my attempt to show you that huh? we have these two relative modular uh, spaces, uh, uh, and uh, it defines a Lagrangian. I'm sorry to interrupt. So, yeah. but, um, originally, before we come to this uh, derived world, yeah. um, this, uh, yeah. for example, in, in, in Jindy's uh, situation, yeah. there's already a good modular stack. That's a more mm. good module. But, but, but that, that module it, stacks can be embedded inside ambient derived module. Uh, so so that, that step or that, that, that embedded into a derived world already take into account his uh, the, the deformation abstraction theory in his problem. Yes, yes. Okay. So so that, that passes. Not not in the sense of degeneration. All that you can say is that Jun Li has a nice deformation abstraction theory for mm. his curve counting theories. Mm -hmm. And that by the result of Tim Ushur, and Toen and Vexosi can also come from pulling back cotangent bundle of the derived stack of curves oh, okay. so there, to the ambient stack. That's it. Okay. And, and then under that setting, you yes. have this theorem. Yes. Okay. By the way, when I say this doesn't exist, okay. So the statement I'm going to say is much smaller than the statement of Junli. Junli constructs a virtual cycle. Right. Yes. What is it I'm trying to say? is the following. I have these two relative moduli cycles, right? If I show you that this is a Lagrangian, and this is a Lagrangian, what, is, what does Jun Li want? What does Jun Li want? Jun Li wants to look at the fiber product of these two things. You have sheaves in here, F. F degenerates into F1 in here, and F2 in here. 
but it's a fiber product because you would like the restriction of these things to S to match. So Julie is not interested in just product of the two moduli spaces. He's interested in the fiber product of the two moduli spaces. So he would like to say that this fiber product thing, the whole thing, has a virtual cycle, which is invariant in some sense, deformation invariant in, inside this family. So the virtual cycle of this whole thing is the same as the virtual cycle of the fiber product. But then the virtual cycle of the fiber product is the product of virtual cycle of this and the virtual cycle of this over here. Okay, that's what Junli wants to do. In some sense, um, what he wants to do is the following. So he says, take m1, m of y1 over s, then take m of y2 over s via the map R1 times R2, R1 times R2, this naturally gets mapped to M of S times M of S itself. Now, I want to glue things. So he says, take in here the diagonal embedding of M of S. Okay? Call this delta. Okay, so now this one has a virtual cycle. Virtual cycle one. This one has a virtual cycle two. He says, I would like to define, let's call this thing a special fiber virtual cycle. So the virtual cycle of the special fiber over t equal to zero, I want that to be the Giesen pullback of that cycle, virtual one, times, literally times, the other side, virtual two. So this is Julie's thing. So this is the cycle of the fiber product. And then he wants to say, this cycle, I want to show that this cycle is the same as the virtual cycle over the not t not equal to t. If the virtual cycles behave compatibly, then the integration against the virtual cycles behaves compatibly. But because this virtual cycle is given as this key simple pullback of this product, it measures the virtual, the invariance of sheaves in here with transversality Shifts in here with transversality, which could do along the device. Okay, so is this idea clear? Okay, what am I going to say? Now let's, let us use all of this machinery. We are trying to use it. Okay, so Julie seems like to like to write down a virtual cycle for the fiber product. The fiber product of the moduli spaces is important. And I would like to calculate some invariant after all from the fiber product and then say that this invariant matches with this. In fact, I cannot show that this invariant matches with this. But at least I can define some invariant in here. How? If I show you that R1 and R2, both of them, are Lagrangians, we can just use the theorem. The fiber product of two Lagrangians in an ambient drive is that is what? It has a minus one shifted symplectic structure. Then the fiber product is a critical locus of a transcendence type function. Then the invariant can be calculated. Right away. So sorry, what, what can be calculated? Invariance. So what, if that? you have the, if you moduli a space, yes, is the critical locus of a Chern-Simon Mustard functional. Yes. There is this Milner fiber calculation that tells you how to calculate invariance. Oh. Oh. You have this function. You look at the free image under this function of the zero, and you look at around zero, and you look at the vanishing cycles, and. And you can calculate nearby cycles and vanishing cycles, and you can calculate. This is generic in, this is routine in algebraic geometry as well as symplectic category as well as the differential geometry. This construction is much cla more classical. So if you show that this whole fiber product is minus one shifted symplectic structure, you're done. Okay? To some extent, what I'm trying to say for the expert in the field is no. But I don't think I've ever actually seen the calculation. So this, and it is not so hard. So this is what I did today. So let me show you. So I would like to say that the Ri's are Lagrangians. Okay. So that the fiber product is minus one shifted symplectic. Okay. So how to do it? Um, Sorry, I, I, yeah. I have a quick question. Uh, yeah. so, there's one, one point. So. Uh, the way you compute invariance, look at this uh, this uh, central singular fiber, right? Yeah. Because all these uh, Lagrangian uh, th th things that happens there. Yeah. So when you say invariant, how do you know whatever you define there is invariant 
uh, definable when you when you move out. Of when you move out, you do, right. you look at the dictionary no way, family. Wait, wait, wait. There, Definitely. you no longer have a definition. Okay. This one. I, I mean, if you define if you define the invariant yeah. first on the central fiber, which is yeah. which is singular, then you have no. You do not know whether that definition That's works right. That's for right. general fiber. Right. This whole fiber product, yeah. I would like to show you it's a minus one shift to some type of struct. Mm -hmm. As a minus one shift to some type struct. Okay. Every generic member of this family is also minus one shift to some type. These are yeah. sheaves on a smooth variety of Calabia of three. Oh. So everything is remaining as minus one shift to some type, ex except in here. In all of these constructions, I was looking at the smooth varieties. It's now a singular variety. Point is that in the level of the moduli space, it's still minus one shift to some type. Only if you can show that these two are Lagrangians, Lagrangian structures. Then you have a moduli space whose shifted symplectic structure does not change. So you're, you're more hopeful, right? <laughs> so, then it's virtual cycle, integration is uh, integration against this. Okay, so this essentially actually tells you that if I can show that this is a minus one shifted thing, then I can construct this virtual cycle. And then I can use the fact that by some result of van der and Levine, integration against the virtual cycle uh, respects cobordisms. So going from here to here, it's like a cobordism deformation of the virtual cycle. I'm oh, sorry, uh, how to construct the virtual cycle from derived geometry? Yeah, we don't do it that. Oh well, okay. <laughs> well, if if you have minus one shifted simplistic structure, yeah, yes. you already showed that you have a perfect deformation of stuff. Yeah, yes. Then you can use Baron and Fanta. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So so, uh, there so you some... take the uh, the fiber product ambient drive this back. You call it F. Yes. Truncate it. You look at the truncation. Yes. T zero of F. Yes. Take the cotangent bundle of that thing. Pull it back. That gives you different construct of this. Then oh. that gives you a virtual set. Thanks. Timo, this is the short, uh, short uh, toe and Betsunzi construction. Okay, so let me prove this. So prove from the theorem. <coughs> to prove that, to prove that the dual maps, dual maps that are ideal from, you know. L dot R I minus one to T dot of M of the Y I over S uh, are quasi isomorphs. Okay, this is an issue. We begin by showing that. Um, Ri induce isotropic structures on uh, m of y i over s. What does it mean? I need to look at. I need to first see whether this moduli stack m of s has any shifted symplectic structure. Then I need to pull it back via each one of these Ri's, and then I need to show that this pullback is homotopic to zero. So in fact, I need to show that there exists a path in the space of isotropic structures from this pullback to zero. That's what an isotropic structure is. If it is a Lagrangian, right? That Lagrangian in a manifold means that you have a symplectic form on ambient manifold, you pull it back, you restrict it to the Lagrangian, you, it becomes trivial. Here everything is homotopic. So it's not trivial, but homotopic to zero. I need to show this thing. Okay. So what is the shifted symplectic structure of my rise space of S? Do you know? In this particular example. This is why I picked Queen. Uh, you said it for copy of the board. There were, there because were, I uh, picked the quintic in here, and because this is a phonocortic, and this is some P3, the divisor in the middle was K3. 
K3 already has a holomorphic symplectic two-fold, and it induces a holomorphic symplectic two-fold on the modulizes already. And that holomorphic symplectic two-fold just literally induces isomorphism between tangent and cotangent with no shift. So M of S has a zero-shifted symplectic structure. So M of S has zero-shifted symplectic structure. It's the moduli space of sheaves on K3. Okay? <laughs> That's okay. So let's go. Good. So you have this thing. Now how do I show it? So very simple, but enjoyable, but I mean it's really simple actually. Uh, so we have the there exists a an exact triangle. Of tangent complexes. Okay, so always have in mind that we are looking at this Ri to here, and we are trying to show that these are Lagrangians. So there is this, this uh, T dot of Ri goes to T dot of. Uh, yeah. Um, is this a Seminar we have a class here, yeah. Yes, okay. Yes, okay. Yeah. You have you guys have a class? Uh, yes, at four thirty. I see. Okay. How much time do we have? Okay. So we can we can go later. We can continue this later but I will try to finish. So we have this and then we have this thing. Okay, and which corresponds to, which corresponds to, we did this last time, what is, um, what is this guy, this is the same as uh, R harm um, Fi, Fi, right? Shifted by one. This we did last time. Tangent complex is this thing. You can see, immediately see. Just take cohomology. H zero of this thing is giving you deformation. H one of it gives you obstructions. That's exactly what the tangent complex does. Okay. And this thing is what? This thing is just literally R um, J uh, you know, J I upper star of R hum F I. F i and uh, <laughs> r j. Oh, actually, this is the draft pull back, and then j lower star. So what is j? You have j embedding of this inside the y i's. Okay, you have this thing. And then let me write down this one, and then you will see actually what, what, what this is coming from. So this is literally the same as this one, again shifted by one. And this one is basically R harm, R harm Fi, Fi again, tensor with some pullback of O of, o of Yi minus S. Again, shifted by one. Okay, so what is going on? Just look at, in each one of these varieties, look at the exact canonical short exact sequence of S. So you have O of Yi goes to O of S, goes to O of Yi shifted by minus S, twisted by minus S. Tensor this thing with R harm, let's say for one of the Yi's. R hum F I F I. Just tensor it with that. What do you get on this side? You will get R hum F I restricted to S, but that is via this embedding the pullback, derived pullback, because it might have torus, derived pullback of this R hum. But I'm writing something in the level of O Y I, so I need to again push it forward because it's a torsion thing which I need to realize in the ambient. So, okay, so this is that. 
and then this one gives you the this middle term, and the kernel gives you this two state. Everything shifted by one. Remember that these are now universal sheaves. So I'm not really working on the level of the moduli spaces. I'm always working in the level of the moduli space times the variety. So Fi's are universal sheaves on the universal sheaf as an object in the supported over the derived category of the variety times the moduli space. That's the definition of the universal sheaf. And so I need to always push forward to these moduli spaces V. Okay, so something like that, okay? And so I need to put a push forward always in here. So let us put this is routine, I'm not saying anything. So I use this exact triangle to show that to show that this thing, I mean I'm gonna dualize it and I'm then gonna use uh, show show you this a quasi isomorphism eventually, but we can do it next time. Okay? But this is actually a very interesting thing. <laughs> you know, it's three pages long, but you can see I really should, you know, this drive geometry business is actually useful. You know? Okay. Let's just stop in here. I will repeat this argument again next time. So, so far, we need, I need to show you that I take the symplectic form of the symplectic structure of the moduli space of M of S on the surface, pull back to here, and I need to show that it's homotopy to zero. That's the first step. Then I need to show that that isotropic structure, a choice of the path from that pullback to the zero, induces a quasi-isomorphism that I want. Okay, so that's the point. All right, let's let's do that.